You're watching Reality Check. When the Taliban recaptured Afghanistan, they were taking over a changed country. And one of the most visible symbols of that change is Tolo News, Afghanistan's first independent news channel, launched over a decade ago, which represented not just the country's growing vibrant media, much of which was banned under Taliban 1.0, and with its women anchors and reporters, represented the hard-won freedoms of Afghanistan's women. How the Taliban treats organizations like Tolo News could become a crucial bellwether for the Taliban's claims of having changed. I'm joined by Saad Mohseni, chairman and CEO of the Mobi Group, a sprawling media empire which also owns Tolo News. Saad Mohseni, great to have you on NDTV. Thank you for finding the time for us. Um, it's been Saad Mohseni, it's been about uh, just over a week now since the Taliban took over and uh, you know, fingers crossed, knock on wood, Taliban uh, is allowing, Tolo News is still on air. Are you surprised at all? Slightly, uh, although uh, over the months, uh, you know, we've been uh, meeting with them in Doha and obviously we speak to them uh, as any news organization does. Uh, they had always assured us that they would be um, uh, open to the idea of having free press in Afghanistan and from operating from inside of Kabul and particular local news organizations. So uh, we are surprised, but we're not that surprised. Okay. But take us back, uh, Saad Mohseni, if you can, to just that, that sort of frantic, uh, quite a scary weekend when they came to power. What sort of uh, conversations were all of you having in Tolo News? Was there any sense of panic or, or worry? Of course, there was a lot of worry. Um, actually, we and it's sort of the that the the the, the hours when uh, Ashraf Ghani and his close aides fled, and then when the Taliban came into the city, were the scariest moments because anarchy and mayhem uh, and a complete collapse of of, of the system itself is usually scarier than sort of a dictatorial uh, Taliban type regime. Uh, so people were very concerned. They were inside the office, well, although we have security, but you just don't know. Sure. Uh, but still, I mean, the, the, our young men and women are very courageous. They carried on. And I think the next day around the afternoon, a group of Taliban came knocking and uh, they asked about uh, security, our security team and what sort of weapons they had. Uh, they checked the weapons. Uh, they confiscated some. And then they went on their way, and they actually even asked us if, they, if we needed any help, and they asked if, uh, if we hmm. needed help for, for, you know, for them to stay inside the compound, to which we said, thanks, but no thanks. But, <laughs> uh, and then subsequent to that visit, we had a visit two days ago, uh, deputy chairperson of the Culture Commission, the Taliban Culture Commission was, was in our offices for about two hours uh, we, discussing yeah, I, various issues. Well, I saw that. You, you so, tweeted a video, uh, pictures of that, um, of that visit. And they, they, were, they, yeah. they were interviewed. And of course, also, you may have seen footage of the one of the Taliban officials who came in for an interview. And he accepted a female host interviewing him inside the studios, as you can probably see on the screen now. So it's been it's been interesting. We can't take these things for you know. I mean, mm. uh, it, it's a long ways to go uh, before we know for sure in terms of how they will treat media Tell me, and uh, news sure. organizations. Tell me specifically about that image we're seeing on the screen because that was a kind of turning point. Uh, your anchor, I believe, uh, Behesta Argand. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Uh, interviewing a Taliban uh, official, you know, un unbelievable. Uh, would never have happened before. Uh, was this something that that they offered? Did you approach them? How how did this come about? I think she was she was doing a program anyway, and he came in, and we suggested that he should he should be interviewed by her. To which hmm. he said yes. Hmm. Uh, you know, you have to remember that the, the world has changed uh, since the late 1990s, not just Afghanistan. Sure. Uh, the world is a lot more engaged. Uh, people are accustomed to social media, conventional media, and so forth. Mm. You have to understand that 65% of the Afghan population is under the age of 20. That's right. These people have never experienced uh, Taliban-like rule. 
Uh, and this applies to both sides. I mean, it, m the majority of Taliban fighters are under the age of 25. Yes. They too have, have, have grown up with social media, with WhatsApp, with Telegram and so forth. So, and watching television. Mm. So I think the Taliban are cognizant of that, of the changes in the country. And they understand that they have to engage the media. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we should not be naive. It's a, it's a movement driven by its ideology. Sure. Uh, restrictions are expected. The question is, you know, how much? Right. No, I, I, I saw that. You made that great point in this uh, op-ed you wrote in the Washington Post that the Taliban's young fighters actually are on, on phones and social media themselves. But, but on the restrictions, uh, Saad, because we saw uh, the Taliban spokesperson, Zabiullah Mujahid, again in an unprecedented press conference, he said, you know, media could keep reporting as long as they follow the following guidelines. No broadcast should contradict Islamic values. They should be impartial. Uh, no one should broadcast anything that goes against our national interests. Now, these are very sweeping kind of parameters to set. How are you at Tolo News interpreting it? Have you had to change your coverage in any way? Have you had to pull back a bit or how is that working? Not the news coverage. The news coverage is the uh, same as always. We have um, toned down the entertainment uh, content. We don't have uh, music clips. We don't have, uh, you know, these very, at the time, they were very controversial uh, Turkish soap operas. Not a lot of flesh. Uh, only because we just want to err on the cautious side and we will reassess. We're reassessing on a daily basis. Right. A lot of our chat shows are back on now. As a matter of fact, one of the Taliban spokespeople uh, showed up this morning for one of our morning shows to have a, you know, just have a conversation. Wow. And, um, uh, but, but news wise, we're not. But yeah, how long is a piece of string? So yes. if you say it has to be in accordance with, uh, with Sharia law, hmm. who's the one interpreting? Uh, you know, Sharia law, if they exactly. say it's in our national interest, how do you define what is in our national interest? By the way, we had similar issues with the previous government and even with the government before that, the Karzai government, that it's very easy to define national interest as something that suits you and is in favor of your narrative. Right. Where, in, in fact, by criticizing the state, you, you, you are pursuing something that's in the, in the interest of the country. No, no, of course. Um, no, so, no, th regime. So this talk of. Yes, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Please. So this this tug of war will continue, but the proof's in the pudding. Let's wait for the government to come in, a Taliban-type government to come in. Let's mm. see what their uh, uh, directives are uh, in terms of the media. Let's look at their media laws. It's, we have a long way to go. No, no, I know. Every, everyone's, everyone's waiting and watching. But, uh, but we are seeing some signs that, that contrary to the rhetoric of, of you know, greater freedoms and all of that, uh, you know, the instance of the Afghan state TV anchor uh, Shabnam Davran, I, I believe she also used to anchor for you, being taken off air. Uh, do you again, I, I, are we reading too much into that? Or does that indicate that, look, the Taliban may be changing, but they're still the Taliban? Maybe both. Uh, I think, you know, and I said earlier that to someone that, you know, we have to wait for the real Taliban to stand up. Let's see who's going to actually be more dominant within the movement, within the government, let's say. Mm. You know, there, there are different factions. Some are moderate, some are pra pragmatic, some are very hardcore. Um, some some may underst some understand that they have to be engaged in the world, whereas mm. others may have this sort of isolationist uh, Afghanistan in mind. So we have to wait for the for, for, for their government. We have to under we have to figure out well we have to see for ourselves right. if they're going to have an inclusive approach the broad based approach will they have women in their government will they have the likes of Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah in their government hmm. as they have implied or indicated and then and then wait for the you know various commissions i mean they they have a very inclusive approach to deciding on these issues they they have a cultural commission they have uh, a media commission so it just remains to be seen. And also, I think individuals today are making statements or deciding on things and um, they will be overruled. The institution itself will, will decide on these important issues. Sure. So, the, so the, 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 the case of that young lady not being allowed in could, be a, could have been a decision made by, by an individual in charge of the broadcaster, the state broadcaster. Right. And they may, they may veto his decision. Or alternatively, they may apply that right across all media. We okay, don't know. but but okay, so but that's an in important point you made. That as far as 
you know, though you might see some instances like this, uh, you've not pulled back from your news coverage. That's not changed much. Uh, but you have modified some of your other coverage, your entertainment, because Mobi has a, a, has a whole kind of bouquet of channels and programming. Uh, that's been dialed back a bit. But as far as your own women anchors and journalists are concerned, um, are they still all turning up to work? Has any of them had to, to quit or sit at home or any of that? Uh, many of them, not many, but let's just say about 20% uh, uh, have decided to leave the country. So for us, we've okay. had this twin challenge of helping them get out, if that's their wish, hmm. in terms of paperwork and trying to get, uh, uh, get them to the airport and so forth. But at the same time, keeping the institution, the, our various outlets, alive. Because you know, when, you run, when you have no anchors, you, know, you can't, you can't, you can't uh, broadcast. Sure. So it's, 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 a, it's a challenging time for us. We've, we've had to employ 10 or 15 people just over the last two or three days. Hmm. Uh, some people just, you know, doing the news for the first time ever, having worked in, in our organization for 24 hours. So it's a, it's a really strange uh, situation to be in, to keep that I... continuity is important for us. But so are the lives of our people. If they decide to go leave, we have no issues with that. But the, the vast majority is still in the country, still carrying on with their work. No, no, I can imagine what an unusual time it is. I mean, uh, on one hand, like you said, your own employees, some of them feeling the pressure. On the other hand, the Taliban walking in and out of your offices, uh, you know, who, who, who could have imagined? But I, I do want to ask you, though, about what kind of future shape things are going to take, because I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're also uh, amongst those who are involved in some sort of negotiations to make sure things kind of work out all right. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Do you, do you, are you hearing from, I don't know, leaders like Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah that the Taliban is okay to take them on board? Uh, and, and what is the Taliban saying? I, 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 you know, the Taliban are c keeping their cards very close to their chest. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to figure out. Uh, they, they want a broad-based approach to governing, but hmm. we don't know how broad-based. Uh, will, will they just offer some token positions to other opposition figures? Or, uh, or uh, um, you know, are they serious about inclusivity? That remains to be seen. Yes, they're engaging the political players. They're talking about national unity. They're talking about um, engaging uh, all the actors. Uh, they're talking about uh, you know, satisfying the Afghan public, hmm. uh, reassuring them that the country is not going to fall apart, that reassuring them that they're going to be OK, they will have their freedoms. So they want to hit, win hearts and minds. They want to engage the political establishment. Sure. But again, we'll, we'll see. And, but the thing is, at the same time, they're going to decide as to what their government's going to look like. They have one and uh, a and B, they have their own constituency, hmm. um, which which will demand certain things and they will demand a strong that's you know dominated by the Taliban establishment they want a government that's probably more res restrictive uh, so sure. for the Taliban too they have to balance the needs and the demands of their constituency as well as what the international community and the rest of Afghanistan wants so but but they're being kind of cagey about that is is what i'm hearing from you they're not they're not very clear if they if, if that's if that's what they're going to allow well, we don't know. They probably don't know. They have their own factions, you know. They have, sure. uh, you know, they 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 have the political and then the military wings, and then within each wing you have various individuals and various factions. So they have to, you know, figure figure things out amongst themselves uh, as to who who will prevail. I mean, it's a movement that has sure. various committees and commissions, but one person eventually has to lead it, right? No, no, that's true. What do you make of um, Ashraf Ghani in all this? Because you've been amongst those who've come out very strongly in the, in the appalling way that he just left the country. Uh, he now seems to be saying that I had to do that because that's the only way I would have, the country would have been safe. And he's now uh, even trying to come back, maybe to get a piece of the action again. Uh, do you buy that? No, no, not at all. What he did was disgraceful, uh, cowardly, and selfish, uh, if I could put it mildly. He, um, there was an opportunity for a sort of a two or three week transition. Um, Dr. Abdullah and uh, President Hamid Karzai were involved in it. They, the idea was for, for them to fly into Doha 
come up with some sort of a transitional arrangement. And the Taliban had vowed not to enter the city. And they, they, are, they, they said that, that we don't have the capacity to manage a city hmm. of six or seven million people. Hmm. But what Ashraf Ghani did and his decision to leave hmm. triggered the total collapse of the system. Because as soon as a, the, when the leader leaves, no one else wants to hang around. So the policemen abandoned their posts, ministers hmm. left their ministries, immigration officers changed clothes. Um, and then all of a sudden we had this mayhem at the airport. And to this day, we haven't recovered from it. Uh, whereas it could have been a lot more orderly. Ashraf Ghani did the selfish thing. He tried to save himself. And this despite you know, many, many declarations, actually up until like a few days before uh, fleeing, that he would never leave Afghanistan, that he would rather die in Afghanistan than to leave. So it was even more shocking, uh, given his uh, sort of declarations, for him to have abandoned his people, his government, his right. closest aides, um, and fleeing to, I think, first Central Asia and then to, to the GCC. You're, you're almost saying that those terrible scenes we're seeing at the airport even today, and we'll try and see if we can pull up some video of that, uh, that is in large part triggered by, by the Ghani uh, sort of evacuation, uh, you know, fleeing. That, that, may, that could have been avoided. Totally. Totally. I mean, we, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sure that even if Ghani was in office and there was a police force, we would have had crowds outside, but not the way we saw. I mean, people ended up you know, on the tarmac, inside planes. There was no control. Hmm. Uh, you saw the scenes of that U.S. aircraft taking off with people hanging off the, the, the wheels and falling off. I think six or seven people died that way. But that's on, that's on Ashraf Ghani. Um, and of course, you also have to hold the Americans responsible, in particular their president. Sure. For, for, for the way that they, I mean, who the hell, you know, pulls out military personnel first and then worries, uh, you know, worry about the civilian uh, uh, officials and NGO workers and, and their partners, the Afghan translators. It was just done the wrong way around. No, no, absolutely. You're right. The Americans uh, also are, are uh, you know, have to carry the can for this. But uh, you're saying... Uh, Saad Mohseni, something that's very important for us in India as well, that when you look at the different factions of the Taliban, uh, you begin to wonder exactly who's going to be in charge. Uh, because you do have the political functionaries from Doha who, who appear to be more pragmatic in their politics. But then you see leaders of the Haqqani network surface in Afghanistan. And, and you know, we all know, especially in this region, uh, what the Haqqani network represent. Now, if they are going to also be stakeholders in running Afghanistan, that's worrying, is it not? Well, it should be, uh, given their track record. Uh, for, for, from our perspective, um, uh, you know, there are mixed signals uh, mm. as to how they're going to divide up uh, power in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, the folks in Doha, led by Mullah Barada, they, they're just the traditional leaders of the Taliban. Um, but then, of course, the Haqqanis have also been very prominent. Um, they, they, they have the support of Pakistan, for example. Sure. Um, and they are, you know, interestingly, they arrived in Kabul as before the, 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 the Kandahari group, mm. uh, perhaps to, you know, um, to, 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 to ensure that they, they were not deprived of uh, the opportunity to play a leading role. Uh, it's difficult to tell. It's a, the movement's a very secretive movement. Hmm. But they, 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 so before they go and engage others, they have to figure things out on their own as to how they're going to actually govern this country, this complicated country. Right. And they will have issues. They will have, they, there's ISIS all over the place. There are still pockets of resistance. Uh, there could be civil disobedience. So it's not going to be smooth sailing for anyone. What, what do you make of the, the, the Panjshir resistance? Uh, you know, Amrullah Saleh, Ahmed Masood, the Ahmed Masood's son, saying we're, we're gathering forces here, we're going to fight. Uh, Taliban says we're coming for you. Uh, is, is that to be, is that, you think that's consequential or, or not really? It's hard to tell. I'm, I'm not sure how many men they have, how much weapons they have, um, that whether they're connected uh, to um, other parts of the country. Hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's hard um, to get a true picture of what's 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 tr transpiring in in Panjshir, and also there's there was some fighting in um, 
in Andarab, which is just adjacent to Panjshir, and right. at certain times were sort of quote unquote liberated from the Taliban. Um, so it ju- just remains to be seen. I think the Taliban are keen to engage um, these sort of opposition figures and and um, resolve these issues through dialogue. Right. And obviously, the the carrot that they will dangle is that you will have you will have a stake in things in Kabul. This is the time for for us to come together. Um, so it's interesting. So I know that they're talking and I know they're fighting. Right. Um, the, the question is, how will this end? And of course, the world is so busy trying to get its people out. I don't think the world is paying attention to this. But I think the next two or three months will be consequential. Conse- it will have huge consequences for within Afghanistan in terms of um, what would transpire. If the Taliban are very rigid um, uh, and not inclusive and... Um, and do not accept these other players that you will see more resistance uh, to their rule. Okay. But if they actually are genuine, then uh, we could see a different Afghanistan. Okay. As, as we wrap, uh, just, to, just to take you back to the beginning, uh, what you're saying is, and you said this in your Washington Post piece, uh, we are compelling the Taliban to be transparent about its intentions and we'll be holding it accountable to those commitments. The Afghan people are watching. The world is watching. That's a great mission statement, uh, Saad Mosseni. And, but you think at the moment, fingers crossed, uh, you can continue to do that? We can, but you know, we will continue to do what we do from either from inside of Afghanistan or from outside or from both. I mean, I think our commitment is to continue the work that we've uh, we've done over the last twenty years, right? To inform and educate uh, and to entertain Afghans and to hold the. Uh, individuals and institutions accountable and that will we will continue that regardless and and the taliban itself in in all these different visits they've had uh, to you you said of course the initial visit was just to make sure everything was okay uh, but like when these culture commission people came uh, have they have they said anything to you at all like you can't carry this or you can't report that or any of that no they've been very respectful and very smart actually because they you know, they they give you some 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 hints in terms, in particular on cultural pro and on you know entertainment programs, but overall uh, they've been they've been smart. They've been very respectful. Winning hearts and minds is important to them, right? And 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 also signaling to the world that you know this Taliban 2.0 is different, but only time will tell. Okay, well. Uh... That's also because, Saad Mohseni, of the kind of institution you built, Tolo News, uh, absolutely fantastic. We are uh, here in India and at NDTV, as you know, big admirers of yours and uh, allies of yours. So we wish you all the very best. And fingers crossed you, you survive this storm as well. But thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you.